Okay, so today's message is called An All-Nighter, An All-Nighter, John chapter 18, and I'm just going to pray before we get started. So dear, I just want to thank you so much for another opportunity just to study your word, and God, I pray by the power of your spirit that you would minister and encourage us wherever we're at in our life, and that you would have something special for us just to take with us. And that we would fall more in love with you as we study your word today. And I pray that you would help me teach in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, how many of you have ever pulled an all-nighter before? Have you pulled an all-nighter before? All right. Is there some that haven't? But... um, I love my sleep, so it's hard for me to pull an all-nighter till the sun comes up the next day. But did you know that Jesus pulled an all-nighter the day before that he went to the cross? On the most important day of his life, Jesus pulled an all-nighter. And so we're going to learn about what happened to Jesus and his disciples during this all-nighter in the next few chapters and how insane it was. And I remember when I was doing youth ministry in junior high and high school, um, we would do an event once a year and we call it All Night Insanity. And we would stay up all night with the youth and, you know, we would turn the children's ministry into a Nerf gun war and... I remember one time I was teaching them, actually I think it was this passage, because I would call it All Night Insanity, and we would study, you know how Jesus pulled an all-nighter too, and they are pulling an all-nighter, and all of a sudden the fire alarm went off, and I had the fog machine down in the Nerf gun children's area, I left it on, and it set the fire alarm on in the church, and so, and I, it was like, I was, I told all the kids to dress up, and I think I was in like my Robin suit with a cape, and then one of the parents just see me like sprinting out of the sanctuary, because I thought there was a fire, but um, all-nighters are pretty interesting. But last time we were together, we studied Jesus' prayer in John 17, and this was the longest recorded prayer in the New Testament, and it's only given to us by John. And one thing I love about the prayer that Jesus prayed in John 17 was after teaching his disciples and talking to his disciples about his father, after he then talks to his father about his disciples and prays for them, which I believe is a really good formula. You know, after we're done talking to people about God, I think it's really important that we continue to pray for them. You know, after he preached to his disciples, he prayed for them. And it's so important that we pray for those in our life especially those we share Jesus with. And John 17 is a very powerful presentation of what prayer is. You know, we saw Jesus prays for himself first, and then we see him pray for his disciples, and then he prays for us. Now, as we begin chapter 18 through the end of the book, chapter 21, we're going to be looking at not only the last few hours of the Lord's life, but his last few days on earth as it pertains to his arrest, his crucifixion, and his resurrection. So let's read verses 1 through 2 of John chapter 18. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with the disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So as Jesus led his disciples on the night hike after their Passover meal up in the upper room, um, they were headed to what garden? The garden of Gethsemane. And there flowed a brook, a small river called the Kidron that crossed in between the Temple Mount and the Mount of Olives. And so the disciples and Jesus are crossing over that brook. Now the Kidron, its name means murky or dark. And I believe Jesus was deeply touched by what was below him as he crossed over the Kidron brook. 
as it was full of blood from the sacrifices at the temple during that time. You know, it was Passover. It was a time of Passover. And the Jewish historian Josephus tells us that during Passover, 256,000 lambs were sacrificed that would be slain during that time, which their blood would flow down. They had like a a canal where the, the, the blood of the sacrifices would flow down the Temple Mount into that brook Kidron to that creek below and cause the water to become very bloody. And so you have this mixture of water and blood. And that's why it's called the Kidron Brook, which means dark and murky, because the blood flowed from the Temple Mount into that creek. And I wonder what Jesus thought when he crossed that brook, as he saw all these sacrifices being made, as he saw that murky, bloody water. And he knows within a few short hours that blood and water is going to flow from his side, right? Remember the Roman soldier pierced his side and what, what came out of him? It was blood and water. As he was pinned to that cross, blood and water would gush out. And the blood of those sacrificed lambs all spoke of the blood that the sacrificial lamb, Jesus Christ, would shed for each one of us. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 29, I have a slide of this verse, and it says, uh, Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world. And as he was crossing over this very dark valley, I wonder if Psalm 23, 4 came into his mind. As I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me, and thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And so what an incredible picture. Jesus and his disciples crossing over this brook. They see the, the, the bloody water. And after he crosses over the brook, he goes up to the side of that hill called the Mount of Olives. And I've actually been to Israel. I got to spend three months in Israel at Bible college there. But it's incredible because I can picture it in my mind. You have the Temple Mount and it kind of goes down. And then you have this little tiny valley. And then you have the Mount of Olives. And so what's amazing is what we're studying here, you can actually go to these different spots that we study in the Bible. And on the Mount of Olives, back then there was many private gardens, and a lot of the rich folks had these um, enclosed private gardens on the Mount of Olives. And so Jesus obviously had access to one of those gardens, and that garden was called Gethsemane. And a question, where did life begin? Where was Adam created? the Garden of Eden. So life began in a garden, and eternal life began in this garden, Gethsemane, when Jesus said to his Father, not my will, but your will be done. That's when it all began. Life began in a garden, and new life began in the Garden of Gethsemane. In the Garden of Eden, Adam sinned, And in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus conquered sin. You know, Adam rebelled against the Father's will in the Garden of Eden, but now here in another garden, it's not a rebellion against God. Jesus is submitting to his Father, saying, Thy will be done. In the first garden, Adam hid from God. In the second garden, Jesus comes to pray and present himself to the Father. In the first garden, man was driven out because of sin. In the second garden, Jesus comes and prepares his soul to die for the sin of the world. In that first garden, man was driven out by an angel placed with a flaming sword to keep man out. And in this garden we're studying today, Jesus tells Peter to uh, sheath his sword, put your sword away. So you got all these interesting parallels contrasting the Garden of Eden and the Garden of Gethsemane. And did you know 
having begun in a garden, life will also end forever in a garden. And the new Jerusalem in heaven, is there a garden? Yes. Um, and it has a garden-like environment with the tree of life. In the last chapter of our Bible, you can read about that garden in Revelation chapter 22, where we find another garden that is prepared for us in heaven that we will enjoy where there's a crystal clear river flowing in the tree of life that bears fruit. Because Jesus, our hero, went through this garden we're studying today where he submitted to the Father's plan so that we can go to heaven. So isn't it interesting to study all those different gardens that we see in the Bible? In Matthew chapter 26, verse 36, we're told that this garden had a name called Gethsemane, which means the olive press. And they would have this giant stone. And when I went to Israel, we got to actually um, see one of these and I got to you know, push it around, um, which was kind of cool. But it's about five feet tall and this stone is pretty heavy and they would put the olives inside that would create you know, great pressure when that stone was rolled over them and it would crush them and it would produce what? Olive oil. And olive oil back then was like gasoline today. It was fuel back then. Um, it fueled oil lamps. It was used for anointing. It was used for cooking. I'm sure you all use olive oil today for cooking. I know my wife does. But the country lived off of olive oil. And so there on that spot, was a press where olives were crushed to get the oil out. And my mouth is um, waters when I talk of olive oil. Or how many of you guys like Olive Garden? You guys like Olive Garden? One of my favorite things about Olive Garden is the bread, and they have the olive oil, and then is it the vinaigrette? What's the, the darker sauce? Balsamic. Balsamic, ooh. You mix those two together. Um, but this becomes a very interesting picture because Jesus is in the garden of the olive press. And I just want you to let that sink in. Jesus is in the garden of the olive press. And we're told in Luke chapter 22, verse 44, that it was at this very point in time, in between verses one and two of chapter 18, that Jesus was so overwhelmed about going to the cross to die for the sins of the world. He was in so much agony. What was Jesus doing? He was praying. And what's insane is Luke was a medical doctor and he recorded that Jesus was so overwhelmed when he was praying and in so much agony that the Bible tells us that his sweat became blood, that it had blood in his sweat. And it fell to the ground and it's a medical term called hemidrosis. It's when you're so overwhelmed that you ooze or sweat blood when you're not even cut or injured. And it's recorded that this happens sometimes to soldiers that are in a very intense battle. After battle, they'll realize, whoa, like I've got blood, I'm sweating blood, and they were not even in an injured spot. But it comes as a result of great pressure when your blood vessels rupture in your sweat glands. And this is what Jesus Christ was experiencing in that garden when he prayed that night before he would go to the cross. And it's a picture of this stone crushing the olive, producing the oil. You know, all the weight of sin came upon Jesus Christ. All of this pressure came upon him as he prayed, and it produced blood and sweat. You know, and Jesus was about to experience several things that he had never experienced before. Uh, number one was sin. You know, you see, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he took the sins of the world upon himself. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.21 that he who knew no sin became sin for who? For me and you, for us. So he literally became sin for you and me on that cross and was punished 
for our sins in our place. 1 Peter 2.24 says, He bore our sins in his own body. Uh, the second thing involved was separation. Because that's what sin does. Sin separates us from God. Isaiah 59, 1 through 2 says, Your iniquities have separated you from God. So Jesus would experience this momentary separation between him and his Father on the cross because our sins he took upon himself, which separated him from the Father right there as he was being punished for our sins. So no wonder... Jesus cried out in Matthew uh, chapter 27. What did Jesus say? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, Judas, Judas betrayed Jesus. And we're going to see that he's leading a mob to find Jesus. And that word betrayal means to expose and give information to the enemy. And you remember that Judas did it for money. And I just imagine it was like, you know, I don't know if you've seen a Beauty and the Beast, that angry mob that was created. Um, but that's just kind of the picture that I have in my head as Judas leads this angry mob to arrest Jesus. Um, in Matthew 26, 15, it says that they paid him 30 pieces of silver to lead them to Jesus. That's about $600 in today's wages. And so when we think of the betrayal, you know, we think, oh, that's, you know, really bad. I can't believe that Judas betrayed him. I can't believe they arrested Jesus. I can't believe that he went to the cross. But wait a minute, did good come out of it? Yeah, it was all part of it. It was a, a giant plan before the beginning of the world. You know, God used that to accomplish his plan of redemption for mankind. And if God can use something as terrible and as tragic as the betrayal of Jesus, the crucifixion of Jesus, to bring out his good and his glory, don't you think he can use the bad circumstances in our lives to bring about his glory and to work things out for our good? Yes. Uh, one of my favorite verses is Romans 8, 28, that says, We know that all things work together for good to those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. How many of you like that verse? I love that verse. And to me, this verse is kind of like a soft pillow that I can lay my head out head on at night. And it's just like, okay, even though this is scary, this is overwhelming. I'm clinging to this promise, God. You're going to work this out for good. Even though I don't know how you're going to work this out, I don't see a way out. But God always has a way of working it out for good. It's a, the truth that we lean on and get great comfort in. And it's amazing to look back in God's past faithfulness. Whenever you're pinned up against a wall and you don't know which way to go, you say, all right, God, I know you're going to work this out for good. I know you're going to have... Something pulled up your sleeve that's going to happen that's going to work out for my good, and he always comes through. It's the truth that we rest upon because it tells us of the sovereignty of God. It's one of the most encouraging truths is that God is sovereign. He is in control and will work all things out for good in our lives. You know, God never says, uh-oh. Ryan, uh-oh, I didn't plan this. He never goes, oops. You know, Charles Spurgeon said, there's probably no other teaching or truth or doctrine that is more comforting to the child of God than that of his sovereignty. And so we have seen Jesus is not a victim of circumstance. He's orchestrating the circumstance. He is the director even though it looks like the enemy is winning right here. Judas, who betrayed Jesus, knew the place Jesus often met with his disciples. The Garden of Gethsemane was Jesus' spot to hang out. It was quiet. It was away from town. And Jesus loved to go there. It was one of his favorite places to go with his disciples. And so Judas says, hey, I know where to find Jesus. So follow me. And so he gets this giant mob. And Judas knows 
where he can find Jesus in Jesus' time of trouble. He knows that Jesus will not be found at the bar. Jesus will not be found watching TV when times are hard, you know, snoozing out. He knows, hey, I I know where Jesus is going to be. He's going to be praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Judas knew exactly where he had been because he had spent so much time with Jesus. And it says Jesus often withdrew by himself to a quiet place, and oftentimes he would go to a mountainside. And a question we got to ask, do people know where we go when we are in trouble? When we're having difficult days, would they say, you know what, I know where to find Ryan. I guarantee you he's going to be on church on Sunday, or I guarantee you he's going to be at men's study, or she's going to be at women's study, or she's going to be with her best friend who's a believer who's going to encourage her. Would your family know if you were going through difficult days, would they say, I know where they will be? I know where she will be. Would they say at church, you know, spending time with other believers, or would they say somewhere else? And I heard recently someone shared how growing up, they always caught their parents reading their Bible and um, praying. And so that was like when they would wake up, they'd go downstairs and, you know, mom would be on the chair and she'd just be reading her Bible, having her quiet time. And that happened throughout her whole life. And she saw her dad do the same thing. And she said that was so impactful because it taught me how to have a quiet time with God. And so she even said intentionally that her mom would like make sure her kids saw, like she wouldn't seclude herself where they never saw her have that quiet time. She intentionally wanted to, to make it obvious to her kids so that kids would know how important it was to have a quiet time. And that's something that I want to implement with, you know, my kids that they say, hey, daddy studies the Bible. Daddy prays with mommy. Um, You know, we pray before dinner. And Judas knew where Jesus was. He was praying in the garden. And what were the disciples doing at this time? They were sleeping. And so Jesus is praying, the disciples are sleeping, and then all of a sudden, you hear all this commotion at nighttime. There's all these lanterns, there's these swords, there's the military, there's cleaning of armor. They come in with all their great power of Rome, all their religious power, all the religious leaders of the Jews. They come in fully armed up on Jesus and the disciples. And so let's read verses 3 through 4, John chapter 18. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? Now, the word troops there isn't in the original text. If you look at it, it's in italics. So whenever you see in the Bible, it's like normal text, and then it goes italic. Um, That means it wasn't in the original text, but they added it just to kind of help us better understand that verse. And so they put that word troops in there, the King James translators, to help us understand that this detachment were indeed troops. They were soldiers that were from Rome. Now the word detachment in some of your translations might be cohort. It's a Latin word which means 600. So now a legion of Roman soldiers is about 600. Thousand. So a cohort is one tenth of 6,000, which would be 600 Roman soldiers. Now that's a big group of people. That's a big group of soldiers. And they've got lanterns, they've got torches, they have swords. And all these guys, who are they coming after? Jesus. At least 600 men, you got to remember they had the religious leaders there too, coming into that garden. 
I mean, this is quite a scene. Well-armed, violence on their mind. It's like that mob in Beauty and the Beast. But Jesus knew how everything was going to play out. He knew what was going to happen. And I love how he got up and did Jesus run away from this mob? No, he ran straight towards them. He met his attackers. Uh, Jesus stands up in that word um, where it says there went forward. Jesus went forward in the Greek means to advance abruptly. So Jesus goes up and went straight toward them and he didn't run away. All right, Jesus is a man's man. All right, he wasn't scared of these guys. He goes straight, he, he faces that hardship right on. And he knew his mission was ordained by the Father. He knew it was his time to be arrested and to be crucified. You and I were on his heart and on his mind, and he's in love with each one of us. And I think you guys can agree, guys will do crazy things when they're in love, right? I, I don't have the exact verse, but it talks about how guys, you know, when they're in love, I mean, they'll cross any sea, they'll go through any distance, you know, to, to have the love of their life. And I believe the gospel is the greatest love story. And so even though there's 600 soldiers, he's about to be crucified. Jesus goes straight on to these guys and says, all right, I'm ready. I'm ready to sacrifice my life for all those who would come to faith in me. And Jesus paid the price that you and I were scheduled to pay, which was death. The wages of sin is what? Death. And so Jesus died for our sins to save us. And Jesus willfully volunteers himself. He wasn't a victim, you know. If he was a victim, he probably would have ran away and they would have caught him, right? He, he, he sees these soldiers and he says, all right, I'm here. And he did it for the love for you and for me. Did Jesus know he was going to be arrested before he was arrested? Did he know that? Yes. Yeah, Jesus knew he was about to be arrested. He had absolute full knowledge of the arrest. Jesus was constantly, continually knowing everything that was going to happen to him. And this points to and speaks of the omniscience of Jesus, the omniscience of God. The truth is Jesus knows everything about everyone all the time. It's one of the qualities of God. And that should put some healthy fear into each one of us because we can fool our family, our friends, our spouse, our coworkers, but we're not hiding anything from God. God sees everything. He knows everything that we're thinking in our head and we can never pull the wool over his eyes. He sees everything. And the amazing thing is he still loves us and he still wants a relationship with us, even though we can be stinkers sometimes. But Proverbs 15, three says, the eyes of the Lord are everywhere. He sees the good and he sees the evil. Hebrews 4.13 says, there's no creature hidden from his sight. All things are naked and open to him whom we must give account. So we got to remember that truth. We're not fooling God. He sees where we go, he sees what we do, and the activities we're involved in. Well, let's read verses 4 through 6 of John 18. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Who, Whom are you seeking? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now when he said to them, I am he, I want you to pay attention to this, they drew back and fell to the ground. Now that word he is that in the normal font. No, it's in italics. So what does that mean? It wasn't there in the original text. So Jesus says, I am. Interesting. When they say they're seeking Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus responds, I am. 
Now, this takes us all the way back to Exodus chapter 3, to the burning bush. You remember, um, God was in the burning bush, and Moses was there. And God told Moses, Moses, I want you to go to Pharaoh and tell him to what? Let my people go. And Moses says, okay, I'll do it. But who do I say sent me? And God says, tell them, I am sent you. Tell them God sent you. And Jesus here uses the name of God. I am. So Jesus is displaying his power and authority by proclaiming that he's God Almighty. Jesus is clearly claiming to be God. And this is important because if we don't believe that Jesus Christ is God Almighty in the flesh, we don't have salvation. There's so many cults and religions out there that say, yeah, we believe in Jesus, but we don't believe he's God. Okay, the Bible, throughout the whole Bible, it tells us over and over again, it shows us that Jesus was God and it's essential for salvation. Uh, Titus 2.13, Paul said, We're looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. In John 20.28, 20, Thomas said, My Lord and my, what? God. Uh, John 10.30, Jesus said, The Father and I are one. In fact, Paul tells us in Romans 9, 5, that Jesus is called the eternal God. In 1 John 5, 20, Jesus is called the blessed God. God in Hebrews chapter 1 says, To the Son, your throne, O God, is from everlasting to everlasting. And I could go on and on and on and on. The Bible clearly teaches that Jesus is God. When they heard Jesus tell them, that he was God, as soon as he said that, I am, what happened? They all fell back onto the ground. Over 600 men with torches, armor, swords. I mean, you can hear all the metal cleaning and, you know, they're on the ground. I wonder if, you know, some fires happened or somebody got burnt or maybe... The fires went out on their torches. I don't know. But, you know, talk about being slain by the Spirit. And I think a great theme song would be, you know, let the bodies hit the floor. But it it was like bowling, okay? Like they just all went down. And how many of you would have loved to have seen this? I mean, that would have been great. Jesus says, I am, and boom, just all these 600 guys. That's soldiers. That's a lot of manpower. And they just fall to the ground. How did Jesus do that? Just by speaking a word, you know, Jesus can make people fall down. And it's just like the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 2, 8, that he will destroy the lawless one in the end times by how? With the breath of his mouth. He just speaks a word and (laughs) Satan's done for. He just speaks a word and it's over. So just his word commands them and they fall backwards. Now, please don't misunderstand. These guys were slain by the Spirit. They weren't slain in the Spirit. You know, there's those today who say, I was slain in the Spirit, and I just lost control, and I fell on the ground and was flopping like a fish and barking like a dog. Have you seen that before? Pastors will sweep their hand, and people just fall backwards. Have you guys seen that before? And they say, I was slain in the Spirit. Uh, The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 14.32 that God is not the God of confusion, but of peace. You know, the Holy Spirit will never make you be out of control like that when you're walking in the Spirit. Uh, One of the byproducts of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. And so we're not ever going to be in a place where we don't know what we're doing and just, you know, all of a sudden we are slain in the spirit and we're flopping like a fish on the ground out of control. Um, That's, we don't find that. These guys were slain by the spirit, not in the spirit. And biblically, there is instances when people fell on their face, but they they were so in awe of God, they just hit the ground and they started worshiping God. 
but I want to say that they fell forward. And sadly today, there's many counterfeit fake responses of people saying that they're slain in the spirit. And you see it a lot of times on like uh, televisions or televangelists and, you know, they'll touch somebody and they, you know, whoa, you know, they, they fall back on the ground and they start flopping. Um, and, you know, they fall backwards in response to a speaker's arm, touch, or push. But we find no biblical basis for these occurrences. And oftentimes, these are just shows that they put on, and it's to get more money. And we don't see that in the Bible. And one of the things that Jesus is communicating to them is that they are not in control of the scene. Even though they have all these powerful men about to arrest Jesus, Jesus, by saying, I am, and they all knock over, he says, hey, I'm really the one that's in control. You know, they know that they're only going to be able to arrest Jesus because Jesus allows them to arrest him. They would have never been able to get up from that dirt if he hadn't let them do it. You know, Jesus could have walked away at this point and said, see you guys later. All right, let's go, boys. But Jesus knew that he had an appointment to make to save the world. But as they're picking themselves up, wondering what hit them, the force of Jesus's words, the power of that proclamation, I am, he asked them one more time. So once they get back up, Jesus says, whom are you seeking? All right, look at verse seven. Then he asked them again, whom are you seeking? And they said, and I'm sure it was probably a lot more respectful, uh, Mr. Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, I'm sure they were cautious. I'm pretty sure when Jesus asked that question again that they braced themselves like, uh-oh, he's going to say it again. But Jesus then gives this great multitude with swords and clubs a command in verse 8. So look at John chapter 18, verse 8. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way. And in verse 9, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke, of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. So Jesus commands them to let everyone else go since they're only seeking him. You know, talk about his power and his authority to keep the disciples safe and secure. He just tells this whole mob, hey, you guys can take me, you're seeking me, but let my guys go. And it was actually fulfilling prophecy. And in verse 10, it says, Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So you can kind of see, this is an all-nighter. All-night insanity. There's a lot of crazy events that happen. And this is just the beginning of the night. This is just the beginning of our study. But Peter wakes up out of his sleep. He's probably groggy. You know, they just had this big old meal together with Jesus. And he's tired, and he wakes up to this giant army. And remember, Peter at dinner said, Jesus, I'll never deny you. You know, I'll, I'll die for you. And Peter, you know, pulls out his sword, like, on guard, you know, and then he just, boom, you know, cuts the high priest servant's ear off. And I don't believe he was going for his ear. I believe he was going for the guy's head. But he missed, um, and his ear falls off on the ground. And you can imagine there's probably blood gushing out, and everyone's looking at his ear on the ground, and I bet Jesus is thinking, like, I can't take you guys anywhere. (laughs) Like, Peter, come on. Like, I'm in control of this thing. Like, you don't have to act all crazy. But I think we should give bravery points to Peter because of how many men there were in this army who came to arrest Jesus. 600 men, and Peter says, yeah, I'll take you all on. Bring it. And he just goes ballistic. And I I just love Peter. He's a man's man, ready to take on 600 soldiers. Now remember, Peter was a fisherman. He wasn't a swordsman. 
which worked out good for the high priest servant. You know, Peter's gift was not sword fighting, it was casting nets. But Jesus, in Luke's gospel, records Jesus heals that man's ear. And it's really interesting, it's, it's the only fresh wound miracle recorded in the Bible that I know of. This could have been a problem, I believe, if Jesus didn't heal this man's ear. You know, I believe that there would have probably been four crosses on Calvary if Jesus didn't heal this guy's ear. And guess who would have probably been on that fourth cross? I think they would have crucified Peter. He just chopped off the high priest servant's ear. But pretty soon, you know, Jesus is going to tell Peter, Peter, just put away your sword. And so Peter puts away his sword. But what is Peter going to be taking out soon? He's going to be taking out the word of God. He's going to be taking out the gospel. And Peter's going to soon understand why all this is happening. And he's going to be really good at using his new sword, the word of God, and preaching the gospel. And many people will come to know Jesus. But Peter could have been crucified right there for that. But Jesus does that last miracle that he did before his crucifixion was healing somebody that one of his disciples hurt unnecessarily, needlessly. The last miracle that Jesus did was to heal a hurt man that was caused by one of his right-hand men. And so many times we are like Peter. We can hurt other people, um, even as Christians. And the Bible talks about when we're not walking in the Spirit, our tongue can be like a sword. And we can really rip people alive with our tongue and by saying bad things. We can even use scriptures needlessly that can damage people that aren't said at the right times. And sometimes in our zeal like Peter, you know, we let the, the sword of our tongue fly or the sword of the scripture fly when God might want us to hold it back for another time. And we can cause hurt and pain that are inappropriate when our zeal isn't balanced with the heart and the spirit and the word of God through prayer. Uh, James 1, 19 through 20 says, My beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And I wonder if it would have been a different scenario if Peter was praying instead of sleeping in the garden. You know, Peter was just trying to prove to Jesus that he was loyal. And so he takes out his sword. Jesus, I'm here for you. I'm going to die. You know, they're going to have to get through me before they get to you. And Peter's like saying, I'm going to muster up my way through this. And he's, he's trying to hack his way through this in the flesh, in his own strength. And how often are we like Peter, trying to hack our way through life in our flesh, in our own strength, trying to do something that God hasn't called us to do, trying to get stuff done with an ax instead of letting the Lord do it and letting him work it out, who tells us, Ryan, I got this covered. You don't need to stress. You know, there's so many times when I hit troubled seas and you probably do this too you're trying to thinking about plan a b c d e f g right and you're trying to think of all these different ways how can i do this in my own strength look at all my resources how how am i going to pull this off and god says ryan just relax just trust me you're spending way too much time trying to figure this out where i've already got it figured out just wait and see one of my favorite verses is exodus 14 14 it says the lord will fight for you and you only need to be what hold your peace be still let's read verse 11 so jesus said to peter put your sword into its sheath Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? So Jesus tells Peter to put away his sword and reminds him, Peter, this is supposed to happen. I'm supposed to be arrested right now because then they're going to take me to trial. Then I'm going to get crucified and the whole world is going to be saved. But Peter didn't fully understand what was happening. 
But Jesus encourages them, hey, it's all a part of God's plan. Let's read verses 12 through 13. Then the detachment of troops and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And they led him away to Annas's first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Now it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ did for us. You know, he sacrificed his life so that we could have eternal life in heaven, so that our sins could be forgiven. And he loves us so much that he was willing to go to that cross and take the penalty that we deserved upon himself so that our sins could be forgiven. And at this moment, we're going to take and close with a communion. And I'm going to have um, Michael come up and just lead us in a few songs. But before Michael starts, I'm just going to read uh, a communion passage um, for us all. But I love communion because to me, it, you know, when our computers or phones are acting up, what do you do? You restart them, right? You, you press the refresh button or the power button, you get a reboot. And communion always gets my eyes, you know, we get so distracted by going out in this world. And communion is just a reminder of what God has done for us and what's coming down in the future, how he's coming back for us. And so I want to read to you 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 30. And this is like a, a communion passage. And there's pretty much three things that we need to do when we come to the communion table, when we remember that Jesus gave his life for us. The first thing that we got to do is we got to look back. What do we look back at? Jesus went to the cross. He shed his blood for us and... Um, he rose again. And whenever we look back at the cross, we got to see that what symbol is the cross in? It's an addition sign. It's in a plus sign because it's a positive thing. Without the cross, we would never be able to go to heaven. And the cross equals love. He did it because he loved you and me. So not only when we take communion do we need to look back at what Jesus has done for us on the cross, but we need to look ahead because Jesus is coming back and he could come back at any moment and rapture his church. And you know we need to be ready for that. Just like if you have like a little dog and maybe you leave them in the car or at your house and you leave, what, what's that little dog doing? You know, they're in that window like, <laughs> you know, where's my owner? And they're so excited for their owner to return. And, you know, we should be so excited because, you know, the end is near. Jesus is coming back and we're going to be in heaven with him for all of eternity. We're going to rule and reign with him. It's going to be glorious. And so we should anticipate and live every day like Jesus could come back today and be prepared for his return. And then the third thing we need to do when we take communion is we need to look within. We need to examine ourselves to see where we're at with the Lord and say, God, search my heart. Is there any place in my heart that needs you to come in and clean house? And so as I read this passage, I'm going to point out those three different things. So 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 30. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. So which point is that? Point number one. Do this in remembrance of me. What did he do? We look back to the cross. He died on the cross for our sins. Verse 25, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 
For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So that's talking about we need to look ahead because Jesus is coming to rapture his church. And then verse 27, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And so there's our three points. We've got to look back to the cross we got to remember Jesus is coming back for us. And then thirdly, we need to look within. And so as we take communion, I'm going to bring uh, the communion cups and the bread up here. And as Michael plays these next two songs, whenever you feel led, just come up during those songs and just bring it back to your chair. And I want you just to have a quiet time with the Lord. Just like Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane, he had a little quiet time with his Father in heaven. And when you take those elements, the bread represents how Jesus was broken for us. He, his back was shredded, his beard was plucked out, they put a crown of thorns on his head. Why? Because he loves each one of us. And so as we take that bread, we remember that Jesus was pierced, that he was pinned to that cross because of his love for us. And as he was there hanging on that cross, he was bleeding. And that juice represents the, the shed blood that Jesus shed because of his love for each one of us. And so when we take communion, we're gonna look back to what Jesus did, thank him for that. We're gonna look ahead that he's coming back, he's gonna rapture us, and that he, pray that he would prepare us for that and that we would live, you know, like that dog, expecting him, excited for his return, excited for heaven, and that we would point other people to Jesus so that they could be raptured and go to heaven when they meet the Lord. And then the third thing that I want us to do when we take communion and just look within and have God search our heart. God, is there anything wicked in me that needs to change? I need help in this area. I've been blowing it. And I, I need you to fill me afresh with your spirit. Enable me, strengthen me to do what you've called me to do. And if you're watching online or you're here today and you've never made that decision to follow Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, I would encourage you to do that today, to make today the day of salvation. And you can take communion and give your life to Jesus while you take communion. Say, God, I want to follow you as my Lord and Savior. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and that you rose again the third day. And so let's pray for our time. And Michael will lead us in those songs. And um, I just want to encourage you to partake of communion. <clears throat> so dear God, I just want to thank you for this time in your word. We thank you how you've given us your word to encourage us to keep on fighting that good fight of faith. God, we praise you and thank you for working things out for good that might seem bad. And you work it out for good. And God, with all heads bowed and eyes closed, if there's someone here today or they're watching online or they're listening on the radio and they want to give their life to you. God, I pray that they would cry out to you in this moment. And that they would make you their Lord and Savior. That they would get off the throne of their heart and put you on the throne and follow you wholeheartedly. And so if that's you, I just want you just to, to pray this simple prayer with me. So, Dear God, thank you for your love for me. Thank you for willingly going to the cross and dying in my place. I appreciate the sacrifice that you made so that I could have eternal life with you in heaven. I believe you rose again from the dead three days later and that you ascended into heaven where you'll welcome me one day. Today I choose to follow you all the days of my life and I need your help. Fill me with your spirit 
In Jesus' name, amen.